the, uh, the way it's organized today, we're going to have a number of people, uh, I hope most of you, who will stay right through the whole symposium. Uh, there'll be a light dinner uh, served between 6 and 7, between 5.30 and 7, somewhere in there. And then we'll get back to it in the, in the evening. Um, and uh, we are uh, very pleased to see people from so many different departments, including, of course, some students. And uh, uh, I expect that the audience will fluctuate a little bit as we go through the day um, and in and out of various uh, phases of the symposium. The first part of this is uh, uh, going to involve three speakers. And uh, we've all been restricted to a mere 10 minutes. Uh, because there are so many people in the audience with things to say, and I want to give everybody a, a good chance to say what they have to say. Um, if any of you in the audience at some point want to present something a little more formally, you can take one of these microphones and, and talk for, let's say, five minutes or so. We'll, we'll try to keep a reasonable uh, limit on, on that side of things. But I, I'd like it to be an exchange of ideas. And the whole point of all of this exercise is to try to gradually lead us all to think of the problem of representing time and the temporal parameter of, of events and experience um, from a multidisciplinary perspective and not just narrow it down to one particular point of view. Um, so uh, I'm going to begin uh, with an introduction. I'll be followed by Charles Burroughs, who uh, is uh, a professor of art and art history here. and. Uh, is going to give us a, a different perspective, uh, uh, perhaps uh, an important perspective, because one of the whole points of my presentation will be that there are many different ways of representing time. And uh, although many of us are familiar with modern physical models of time, uh, it took us a long way to get there. And the whole point is, how does the nervous system represent time? How do, how do people uh, before the, the 20th and 21st century conceptualize time, and how do most people in their daily experience conceptualize time. Um, we, we'll, that will be followed by um, Yana Popova, who's a professor of cognitive science here at uh, CASE. And uh, she will be speaking um, about time and self-projection, uh, which will lead very logically into, after a coffee break, uh, the main speaker of the day, who we're very pleased to have from University College Dublin. Um, who is uh, going to speak on self subjectivity and memory, reflections on possessing and on being possessed by memories. Um, so I'm going to uh, begin by giving you a general introduction to the topic. And um, on our website, there was a little uh, summary of some of the things I, I hope I choose the right one here. I'm, I'm not somebody else's talk. Ah, that looks familiar. OK. And we'll go right straight to here. I guess I just pressed that. OK. So I'm going to talk about evolving constructions of time. Um, and of course, that's a bit of a pun, because um, as you probably know, I'm interested in cognitive evolution in the prehistory, if you want, of the mind and how we came to be the way we are. And uh, at the same time, our own constructions, even within culture, keep evolving and changing as any of you who followed modern physics uh, would understand. And I just want to give you a, a, a notion that when you speak of, of, of representing time, um, you can speak of, of it at least on three levels. And I'm going to try to review these. Um, in my own model of the nervous system, I reviewed uh, all of the literature on many, many different species. And we know that simple animals, even insects, can represent time in the following sense. They can, some of them can perform a delayed response very accurately. They know exactly how long to wait before doing something. If you give them information, somehow they can, they can represent time and delay their response. You could even say that simple insects have some representation of time. There's a, there's a number that physicists know and that some physiologists know called tau, T-A-U, uh, which is um, time to impact, time to collision. You know, if you're a flying insect and uh, you don't want to squash yourself when you fly to land on a tree, you have to decelerate very precisely just at the right moment. And in fact, if you're being chased by a predator, you've got to, you can't do it too early. You can't do it too late or you're squashed. 
you have to land just at the right, and a bird also calculates tau in a different way when a bird lands time to impact. And it's now understood fairly well that, that, that it has a lot to do with the expanding visual world just at the moment uh, of impact. Many, many different species can calculate tau in different ways, so there's no single mechanism for it. But it is a representation of time. So I have suggested that there are three levels of, of uh, time of representation in the nervous system. One on the level of simple binding of most simple events, such as a frog catching a, a fly that cross, uh, crosses its, uh, uh, its visual field. And if it, doesn't, if it miscalculates the time parameter, its tongue will not hit the fly. It has to be accurate. The second one is, is on the, the short-term memory uh, basis. And that's the basis of things like delayed responses. When you hold a response for 10 or 15 or 30 seconds uh, because you know that if you respond too early, you, you won't uh, be rewarded, you won't get what you want. And the third is what I call slower moving working memory process, ITG, intermediate term governance, which is something that I think is fairly unique to humans and maybe some of the social mammals. And that's the idea that you can represent very long periods of time that are way outside your immediate experience. And the question is, how do you do that? Um, I've also suggested that those three levels ultimately subserve culture by supporting ITG or intermediate term governance so that cultural models of time can then be incorporated into the nervous system. Um, so I want to just talk about three models that are, uh, are, are in play when we talk about time. The first one is what might be called a base rate model. And, and the principle is that the sense of time is constructed from irreducible moments of experience and that we can measure those irreducible moments. And that all representations of time ultimately have to be based on that standard base unit. That was a whole industry of research uh, 20 or 30 years ago on the psychological moment, it was called, uh, on the minima of time representation. What are the shortest periods that you can represent and therefore are all longer periods, multiples of the shorter periods and so on. That's a whole field. Um, and uh, the base rate model says that you can't sense anything shorter than the base unit and that there's a biological clock somewhere in the brain that is calculating time and keeping track of time. Um, and that biological clock, of course, uh, can change and therefore your base rate can change under the influence of drugs and various other things. Uh, the second model is what you might call an episodic memory model. Andal Tulving, a very famous memory uh, theorist, uh, who's now retired but still very active, um, proposed this some years ago. And the idea here is that time is not perceived directly but rather constructed in memory. And it's an imaginative act. That is to say, uh, the construction of time and your whole sense of time involves time travel and memory. And that's his term. Um, the perception of time comes from one's ability to compare past experiences with present ones and project these into the future. And he calls this time travel. Um, it's uniquely human ability, and according to his theory, I, I, I'm not taking a stance on this, I'm being neutral in my talk, um, but um, he has amassed a great deal of evidence supporting the notion that uh, episodic memory is indeed very special. Whether it's unique to humans is a question that we don't all agree on, um, but it's, it's a totally different concept because it says not that the temporal minima are the basis of time, but rather your ability to compare past, present, and future in memory. And then finally, there's what you might call a cultural model, which broadly includes a great deal. Uh, but the cultural model says that every aspect of time, the apparent duration of events, their rate of passing, their redundancy, indeed the very experience of time itself, is relative to a cultural worldview. And uh, again, this is a radically different approach because it says that uh, and I think there's a great deal of support for it on one level, that your, certainly your perception of larger events uh, can be radically affected by culture and technology. Technology is a part of this. And, and they can see that there's a minor role in our experience of time for some kind of universal biological clock or primitive memory record, but the virtual world framed in virtual time is largely a product of culture and to a significant degree of technology. Um, and I, I, I think that we all agree who work in the modern work environment that's so electronically driven that our sense of time somehow has been hugely affected by the framework of timekeeping devices, including email, that now drive us 
relentlessly, uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, unless we construct some sort of defense mechanism against it. So um, we have uh, all of these elements in play, and I would encourage you to uh, uh, be open to different points of view you're going to hear today. There are a lot of very different approaches, and obviously on the base rate model, you might even want to tinker around inside the nervous system and look for biological clocks and so on. And minima um, in the episodic memory model, you, you also are interested in, in, in nervous system, but you're also interested in people's uh, performance behaviorally and, and, and to some degree in their subjective uh, records and in pathological cases of memory def defects, amnesia. And then finally, on the, on the cultural model, uh, well, of course, you're you're interested in the construction of time, the deconstruction of time, and the cultural comparisons uh, between different groups and so on. Um, I was going to say that to some degree, time is very much influenced by what I've called the external symbolic storage system, by exagrams or external memory systems. And uh, you can, if you look at something like Stonehenge or any kind of massive astronomical construction, and there are many different civilizations that have constructed similar things, they are timekeeping devices for the entire culture. They are ways of tracking time for harvesting, for various uh, celebrations, um, for um, uh, even religious events of various kinds that are of importance to people. So timekeeping on the massive scale is something that's very related now to technology and particularly to computers. And also is very much influenced by our subjective view, uh, uh, our, our cultivated cultural view of time. Um, I've made the point that we carry many different types of representations in our mind at once as modern human beings and that all of these things are affecting our sense of time. And I think it's rather important to see how they interact, how these different levels of representation interact. Um, I just uh, would also suggest that consciousness has a very major uh, role in this, uh, that somehow our awareness of time is both direct and enormously influenced by uh, all sorts of uh, indirect uh, factors, including culture itself. Um, and that's, uh, that's by way of just a brief introduction to the theme. And uh, uh, perhaps uh, what, I, what I suggest that we do is that um, as each speaker uh, presents, and obviously our first uh, uh, next, our next speaker, Charles Burroughs, is going to take it from a cultural perspective. Um, we should have perhaps just a few minutes for questions for each speaker and then a general discussion after we've all finished because we'll have plenty of time for that, uh, as it were. <laughs> time always comes into all our factors. So initially, I'd, I'd like to entertain any questions you might have about my presentation uh, and about getting on with it. And at that point, uh, perhaps we can have uh, Charles step in. So please ask questions if you have any right now. And we'll, uh, rather than have the three speakers in a row, we can also do that if you prefer. Questions? Yeah, go ahead. Your concentric representation of episodes yes. are uh, surrounded by mimetic, linguistic, yes. and external. Could you explain that? Just OK, sure. Um, I'll just go back. The, the episodic memory model of, of Tolving would be embedded in this level so that your, your representation of time in your life, the stream of consciousness, as, as James called it, re is, is a series of events and episodes that are remembered. And they are remembered in a very particular way. In fact, it's a very remarkable thing because um, episodes in your life are not clearly bounded. Your, your, your own perceptual systems and memory systems allow you to create those boundaries. And many, many different species of social animal can do this, not just human beings. So uh, you remember episodes. And um, uh, Tolving's point is that only humans seem to be able to compare them in memory so that you compare the past and the future and in the present uh, uh, tense, as it were. So you right now might be conceptualizing the past and comparing the past with a projected image of the future. An example would be. Um, how you remember the climate to have been when you were a child, and how you imagine it to be in another 20 years. And of course, you know the present. And you develop a sense of your own time by doing that. So that's, that's an episodic memory model. And within that, deeper down, you would find the old um, binding model, the minding, 
the, the, the notion that um, a minimum uh, a psychological moment may be the building block of this. The cultural influence is, is multi-leveled and very complex and involves uh, representations that are nonverbal that I call mimetic language-based representations and then external representations such as equations and, and various types of external uh, devices that we've constructed over the years for including art and graphic representation that allow us to conceptualize time. So graphs, for example, allow us to convert time into space into a spatial concept and that sort of thing. That's, uh, does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Okay, oh yes. Huh. First or second slide with different time durations. Mm -hmm. if you can just arrow back to get there. I can just arrow back? Oh, okay. Oh, yes, I can. All right. Uh, I'm curious whether the different uh, time, time periods uh, have, in general, have to do with different, um, different facets of perception or human capabilities, like sensory or other ones. Absolutely. Uh, binding has a lot to do with sensation. In fact, you could say that it's the theoretical basis of sensation in the nervous system. And it's, uh, there are a lot of different theories of binding, uh, none of them yet proven, but lots of, of evidence too being accumulated about how the nervous system locks together various circuits into a bound system that represent something, some idea, some sensation, some experience. Time uh, quite possibly might be one of those. It's, uh, uh, we just haven't gotten there yet in terms of the physical mechanism. Um, a lot of that has to do with oscillations in, in the nervous system, so-called gamma synchronous oscillations. The short-term memory representation is one that also is based on a lot of nervous system research because the systems that represent time in a, in a span of, let's say, 5 to 30 or 40 seconds uh, is a different brain system altogether. And um, in, in our experience, that would represent something like um, our ability to remember what was just said to us, our ability to remember images of past events that might have just occurred, and we can position ourselves. So if you're watching a game of some sort and a goal is scored and you are trying to replay the image in your mind of what's just happened, that's that sort of thing. Or you're having a conversation trying to remember what somebody just said 20, minute, 20 seconds ago or 30 seconds ago, that's reliant on your short-term working memory system. ITG or intermediate term governance is, is more like the scale that we're working on now in minutes or hours when you're having a very elaborate, especially language-based presentation, but not just language. It's also true of nonverbal behavior. So for example, an athlete playing a game may remember all sorts of things about that specific game, and it may go on for several hours. And it's very complex. It's a very complex scene, auditory and, and, and sensory scene. So, so those are very basic mechanisms that, that establish the basis of episodic memory. And you can see the connection, I hope, between basic sensory binding and, and episodic memory in a general sense there. Yeah? This comes with, to your idea of technology as a relationship to, to the mm -hmm. creation of representations of time. Uh, the most basic kind of technology a person humans possess is, is, is counting. I was wondering if counting was something you thought about, if counting is somehow a universal human ability? Yeah, actually. So the question is, is counting a universal human ability and does it bear on our perception of time? <clears throat> I would say that it definitely bears on our perception of time for a number of reasons. Um, but um, it, um, it's not universal, actually. Uh, it really, a numeration system is not universal. Some system of counting uh, exists in most cultures, I think, although linguists have argued over whether every culture has even, even the number 10. There have been supposedly cultures that, that only represent a small number. There was a famous case of one that was supposed to represent one, two, three, and more. Um, I'm not sure whether that's uh, apocryphal or true. But um, it's not a given that we have a, a system for counting uh, that would be applied to time. And I think that the way it really plays out in technology is, for example, in European history when the appearance of, of town clocks that coordinated work started in, the, in uh, I believe, the, the Middle Ages, that, that has a huge impact on a sense of time because it, there's a sense of urgency. I mean, if you're hooked into the modern system, you may get anxious over losing 15 minutes because you have deadlines to meet and meetings to go to and so on. And so your sense of time is very urgent. Uh, I think in more relaxed times, people's sense of time was much looser, but it still was attached to various markers. 
But the counting really started to be important, I think, with the implementation of clocks and regimentation uh, on a massive scale. But some people may disagree with that. We can, we can have discussion. Yes, any further? Oh, I, would, I would just add to that. It actually predates clocks because the sundial really tells a very similar type of time that the early clocks do. Um, but the clocks uh, rang bells, and in that there is an urgency. Yeah. And, and old water clocks, clepsidras, uh, back in the you know, pre-Christian times were, were also probably synchronizing. And I can't imagine that the Egyptians built the with the pyramids without some sort of timing mechanism to coordinate tens of thousands of workers. Um, so uh, yes, but I think that, that uh, all of that seems to be related to writing and numeration systems. And they are not universal. There are many societies don't have that. Yes, Jim. All, all the models that I saw had boundaries yes. in them, and I was wondering if anyone has developed a system which is a continuum that had a model of time. I don't know of any. I think that's an interesting, I mean, I think that an objective physical model of time, something out of physics, might try that, but in a way that's not dealing with the psychological reality of time at all. It's, it's not dealing with cognition, it's dealing with an objective physical world. In, and the question from our perspective is, all right, even if you can see that, that organisms evolved in this objective physical world, how did they come to represent time in the nervous system and in their own minds? That's the kind of question that we're asking. I got to that was I was trying to define an episode. Uh -huh. and, and you had a circle around it as though at some point it wasn't an episode anymore. It was part of something bigger. And I was wondering if there were within episodes, if there were. Well, I'll give you an example of an episode. Uh, I, I don't want to take the time to bring up a slide, but an episode, a typical episode would be a dogfight. All right, now, dogs can not only remember dogfights, they can remember exactly who won, who lost, where the fight took place, what the consequences are down the line, and so on. And yet, a dogfight has no boundaries around it in time. That is to say, and it's a very sloppy event. Uh, the, the, uh, the sounds don't correlate with the visual aspect, the taste, the pain, the movements, uh, they're all on different timelines in a way, and yet somehow the brain can cause all of that to be perceived and remembered as a single event. It's an extraordinarily complex computation, and any social animal can do it. So that'd be a typical, a typical episode, and within that episode, you have many events. One do dog A bites dog B, that's an event. You could even say the moving of the jaws is a, mi a micro event. So the episodes are built out of these events. And within those events, they would argue, well, the temporal minima kick in of, of, of time. And those events have to be constructed from those temporal minima. So that's from a, from a nervous system point of view, how these mega representations of events are built up. And certainly my own culturally model, culturally based model is entirely built up from event representations, which, by the way, is a very important field of research in child cognitive psychology because the question is how do children step through various stages of being able to represent events? And that, of course, ultimately cul culminates in an adult sense of time. That takes a great deal of time to build, as it were. A useful concept time, isn't it? <clears throat> Can apply in many ways. All right, well, I'll call the, the, the since I'm also the chair, I'm compromised here, I'll call the first session and ask our next speaker, Charles Burroughs. Thank you very much.